now and we'll just let everybody come in. Anybody well, else that's running? Today we're at 2.33, so I think so, Lyra. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to our PD Masterclass on Person-Centred Leadership. My name's Elira Bowden. I'm the new uh, Nurse Manager for Research at ISLED, and I've just been welcomed into the PD Collaborative for ISLED and South East Sydney. And I have the honour today of introducing our guest speaker and also giving our acknowledgement to country. So what I might start with first is just to update us all on what our admin tasks are today. So as Susie says, she's muted everybody as you're coming in, which is great. Uh, just letting you know that today's session is being recorded and it will be uploaded on the South East Sydney uh, YouTube channel. Uh, we've also, uh, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to pop them in the chat. Susie's going to monitor that. And we've also got some question time at the end of the presentation. Uh, at the end of the session today, there'll also be a QR code for an evaluation, which is really important to give some session feedback, but also give the group some ideas and suggestions on who you would possibly like for future presenters or future topics, especially coming towards the end of the year, it'd be great for us to think about what our plan is for 2023. So without further ado, I'm just going to read our acknowledgement to country and then introduce our guest speaker. So today we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that we're meeting on today. So today I'm meeting on Darawal country. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and celebrate the diversity of Aboriginal people and their ongoing cultures and connections to the lands and waters of New South Wales. We also acknowledge and pay our respects to our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. And obviously uh, acknowledging all the traditional lands that you are, are meeting on today and the country that you sit with today. So without further ado, it's my absolute honour to introduce Dr. Beck Middleton. So Beck is a senior lecturer in the School of Nursing at the University of Wollongong. She's been working in PD and person-centred facilitation for 15 years and is passionate about how best to implement person-centred ways of working in both the student and health professional engagement, learning and practice spaces. And she has a specific interest in person-centred leadership. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'll hand it over to you, Beck. Thank you so much, Alira. Um, I'm just going to start to share slides and keep my fingers crossed I'm on the right one. Um, so thank you for joining me today. It's um, it's a real privilege to be able to spend a little bit of time with you and talk about person-centered leadership. So as we go through, please feel free to pop things in the chat um, or to um, just ask at the end, whatever is best for you as we go through. Okay. Um, so I guess just before we get started, consider what does person-centered leadership mean to you? So how do you experience it? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And what does it feel like to you? And maybe just make a mental note or if you want to jot something down, just to get your head into the space. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, correct, yeah. Have a list of those. Yeah. Okay. Probably, I can probably put it on that flow chart anyway, so that it's just. Sorry, I'll just wait till that person's muted. Thank you, Susie. Um, so hopefully you've just got something in your mind now about what it is. So let's have a look at person-centeredness before we actually move it and connect it to leadership. Um, the term person-centeredness is used a lot in health and it underpins a lot of our um, health documents. For example, the NAMO RN standards for practice begin with um, the introduction that states registered nurse practice is a person-centered and evidence-based, and then it goes on. Um, HETI, CEC, and many other health institutes espouse person-centeredness in their values and in their ways of working. So we've seen this definition, I'm sure that you've seen it a number of times, but what does it mean for us as individuals, as healthcare providers, and as leaders? So I just want to give you a moment to read through it again, and maybe just pull something out that speaks to you today. let's see if we can build on that now. So um, McCormack, uh, way back in 2004, um, talked about how there are four core modes of being that underpin person-centeredness. 
And we can see them on the slide here. So being in relation is one. And so in, in, in and around this, he talks about the importance of interpersonal processes that enable relationships that have therapeutic benefit. So evidence of therapeutic um, relationship between person and care provider. And it, for this to occur, it requires partnership to ensure that people's decisions are valued, that there's a, mutu a mutuality of respect and non-judgment without um, a focus on a, on a balance of power. Um, it also requires valuing self, moral integrity, reflective ability, knowing ourself and knowing others, and flexibly um, working off that, so being reflexive. The second um, element is about being in a social world. This is just about making sense by creating and recreating meaning with the social world that we live in through narrative. Being in place, we embody spaces as we connect with places consciously and unconsciously, making comparisons to previous memories. So how do we actually connect our past to our present? And then being with self, the need to be recognized is a fundamental human need. And this brings respect, then it brings relationship through which our personhood is revealed. So this is about respecting our values and having our values central to any process. And central to these modes of being um, is about respect for persons that's manifested through mutual respect, self-determination and understanding. So how does this sit with your view of the world and your engagement in healthcare? And how is person-centered different to say holistic or patient-centered or therapeutic or any of the other variable um, the words that we often hear in practice. So now let's start to think about leadership and then we'll blend the two. What does the word leadership mean to you when you hear it? Do you think that it's innate or is it something that's learned? Is it something that can be strengthened? <clears throat> and can it be person-centered? You know, we've kind of made an assumption that it can be um, in the title of this presentation that it's person-centered leadership, but maybe, maybe that's not the case. And we all have different perspectives and different frames of reference. So even just looking at the picture that's on the screen, some people will see two older people. Some people will see, uh, I call them Mexicans, but they may not be, they might be another culture, but we all see different things um, and our lens is different. And so how we um, see leadership comes from our experiences and the context that we're in. The modern study of leadership is generally accepted as beginning around 1840, which I know is not so modern anymore. Um, and that began with the great man um, uh, theory. So this was the work of Thomas Carlyle, where he um, had a lecture series and then a publication later on, on, which was called On Heroes, Hero Worship and the Heroic in History. But then through time, this was challenged and it was extended. Um, and I guess the first real leap that came was in um, 1978 when James McGregor Burns talked about two different contrasting modes of leadership, transactional and transformational. So I guess at its most simple um, transactional leadership is the promise of reward for work while transformational leaders um, approach their work from a more altruistic perspective, seeking to truly engage their followers and motivate them to bring them to higher levels of performance. So leadership is thought to have evolved in a less linear manner over the past 30 years or so. Rather than seeking one true theory of leadership, uh, more recent work has explored the idea of leadership from different perspectives. And these do include um, the person-centered idea of authentic leadership, servant leadership, humble leadership, um, as and sometimes these are mixed with complexity, and um, but they can also be a little bit ambigu ambiguous, um, but they're all within systems. So um, Cusis and Posner, which I know some of you will know quite well, um, 
they talk about how leadership is not the reserve of a few charismatic men and women, but it's about ordinary people that bring out the best in themselves and in others. And so they talk about it as being a behavioural um, practice that we do. So observable and learnable sets of skills and abilities that we can apply at all levels, at the micro, the meso and the macro. And then when we get to person-centred leadership, I guess these are just a few things about what it might look like, um, that treating each interaction with another as unique, an encounter that can transform an individual's being in the world through authentic connections. <clears throat> but being authentic does require us to consider factors such as individual relationships, emotional engagement, knowledge, decision-making capacity um, in determining our being in the world. And when um, authenticity is not a priority and it's not practiced, then that can raise all sorts of um, issues and problems because we're not necessarily meeting the needs on behalf of others. So one will become dominant and the other person will become or be made dependent. So it almost reduces the other to a thing. So rather than us being in relationship, it's... Uh, it's us and them almost. So viewing person-centered practice from the perspective of authenticity starts from the position that everyone has inborn potential, but that individuals learn how to exercise that potential through socialization. So it's how we practice it in our contexts. So I guess a couple of questions for you to just think about. What does person-centered leadership look like for you? Just given what we've looked at so far, and then consider whether you even think leaders um, should behave in a person-centered way. And if you think that they should, well, why should they? What are the factors that would um, contribute to the reasons behind that? So McCormack in 2021 used the work of Christopher Alexander, who is actually an architect um, that used properties of nature to guide his work. Um, and McCormack used this as uh, to frame his approach to person-centered leadership. So that we can see the properties here. And the end point is to enable others to flourish. So for the architect, for Christopher Alexander, it was for his, um, his structure or his, his piece of work to be the best state that it could be so that others could appreciate and enjoy but let's take a moment to consider how these points taken from nature can help to create cultures and context that are inclusive and help other people to live flourishing lives. So how can living in harmony with natural places help us to be effective as people, as leaders? If we think about strong centres, um, McCormack links this to our values and how this is actually our essence and what we need to work from levels of scale, that when we work within systems, we need to be able to make sense of those systems for ourselves and for others, and to unpick it so that others can be more effective in what they do. Boundaries about helping others to focus on the center, so on the values. Good shape, about having physical and mental health and well-being. So how, how we stay in a healthy state is critical in teams, and also how we as leaders role model that for others and how we authentically do that. Positive space, creating a context where people can be the best that they can be. So enabling energy, enabling flow between people, enabling connection between everyone. Local symmetries, McCormack talks about this as being the glue, that they, this is actually the glue which holds the space, it holds the team, it holds the effectiveness. Alternating repetition is about continuously rehearsing, bringing a sense of order so that it can be repeated time and again. So thinking, for example, about meaningful conversations. Roughness, this is about stepping outside, learning to be free in taking a risk, in giving things a go, or as um, Kuzis and Posnes would say, in challenging the process. Simplicity and inner calm, this is about keeping things simple, not always being busy or giving the impression of busyness, not always doing, but actually focusing on being and becoming. And that then leads to stillness, which is critical to simplicity and calm. So these 
uh, very closely aligned. So we have to help people take breaks. We have to help create space and we have to step back from the everydayness of life to reflect and consider where we are. And then not separateness. That one kind of jars me a little bit with grammar, but not separateness. Um, the ability to adapt and deal with complexity. So our role as leaders is to facilitate that space. So let's just take a moment now to listen to Brendan's summary. So wish me well as I do this. And so for me, those 15 uh, elements um, of nature really sum up who I am as a leader and how I try to be. But what I would say is the most important thing is that being happy, going back to Aristotle's idea, is actually a revolutionary act in ourselves. To really be that kind of leader, we have to really challenge ourselves. We have to really uh, think about the boundaries. We have to really take risks. Um, and I have to be very um, strong in terms of being authentic uh, because being vulnerable as an authentic leader is absolutely crucial to helping others um, understand the importance of being together and how it is that collectively we can flourish. Nice and oh, so sorry, I'll just move on from him now. Um, so if we take it back to the modes of being of person-centeredness and we focus on being in relation, it is about being in relation. Um, contemporary professionals, they want to be led, not managed. We know this. And there is increasing evidence that good healthcare practices are built on strong and healthy relationships and cultures that balance counting with caring. Um, from an existential humanistic paradigm, leaders lead in relationship with others. And those being led are valued for who they are rather than as a means of um, to an end. Yeah. So person-centered leaders are authentically other-centered, others-centered and caring. Being patient, being optimistic and open helps person-centered leaders respond appropriately to each person that they, that they come into co um, contact with at each moment in time and within each context. And so it helps to create conditions for self-actualization, for empowerment and for well-being. So some leaders might be concerned that these traits actually prevent professional distancing or foster over-involvement. Sean Cardiff in his work found that by using intra and interpersonal intelligences, person-centered leaders are able to move through different levels of engagement with the people around them, appropriately taking ownership of problems or leaving problems where they belong. So they don't seek followership, but they seek a mutuality and a reciprocity. They use inquiry and emotional intelligence to hear, to read, to understand the other person and their state of being. And they're willing to show their own vulnerability. But being person-centered does not occur spontaneously. It requires reflexivity. It requires asking, what does this person need in order to come into their own? How can I offer them what they need? What are the possible consequences of my or our actions? And is this then the right thing to do? And for who? Although person-centered leadership can be learned by anybody, knowing ourselves is considered to be a prerequisite to building relational trust. So like transformational leaders, person-centered leaders aim to develop the leadership skills at, at the same time as acknowledging that not everybody um, can be empowered all the time. So affording equal importance to the individual as the whole team, internal motivation and commitment is nurtured alongside growth, development and well-being. So let's hear what the chief nurse has to say um, about her own person-centered leadership. Mm. Uh, thanks, Nick. Look, it's... I guess if I think about, and you said, you know, we've known each other for a long time and, and worked in various roles. So it, I guess it, there's been a constant sort of focus throughout the roles that I've held within uh, New South Wales Health, right from a, a nursing unit manager to a facilitator, uh, a local director of nursing, and now at a state level. And I suppose the thing that does change as you go through those different levels is, is the, um, the scale of that. So as you'd appreciate, now I have visibility across a state, a jurisdiction, and then nationally as well about some of the things that are occurring there. Um, so if I think about my own leadership 
those principles don't change uh, whatever kind of sort of scenario or context in which I'm working in. So there's some core values, I suppose, that drive my leadership uh, and a belief in how leadership can shape and help us to deliver things that we need to do to provide the best possible care to patients uh, in the communities. And I think if I keep coming back to the reason why we're here, and the reason we're here, of course, We, we, I've obviously cut it off inappropriately there mid-sentence, but I think one of the key things from um, Jackie there is that actually the principles don't change, you know, that there are those core values and the principles in us don't change. We don't change as people. We grow and develop, but our, our core remains the same. Person-centered practice is defined as a formation and fostering of healthful relationships with service users, among staff, um, based on the humanistic values of respect for persons, individual right to self-determination, mutual respect and understanding. We, look, we saw that in the definition right at the beginning. So the qualities and behaviours can be learned. And this, um, the person-centred practice framework, which I know is used uh, a lot in both districts, um, you know, it's a, it's a terrific tool for us to use to look and see pattern-based principles to guide person-centeredness at the individual level, at the team level, and at the organizational level. The study of person-centeredness in healthcare leadership, it's emerging, um, and it is still in the early stages. And Sean Carter, who I mentioned earlier, was one of the first to research person-centered uh, leadership in nursing. So I'd like to just briefly consider his work now and look at some of the key principles that he um, found in his PhD thesis. So in line with relational leadership theory, Cardiff undertook research that explored how person-centered leadership manifests in clinical nursing. And as we know, most leadership models and theories that we use in nursing and healthcare generally were developed outside of the healthcare context. So that, that's one of the real beauty, um, beautiful things about um, Sean's work. So Carter found that person-centered leaders use a set of attributes and processes for being and for becoming a person-centered leader in relation and relational connectedness. Person-centered leadership, it's a complex, it's a dynamic, relational and contextualized practice that aims to enable self and others to achieve self-actualization, empowerment and well-being within the possibilities and constraints of the context. And Cardiff uses this image to frame his perspective on person-centered leadership. Um, and I, I really love this. I love how he describes it, which is why I'm, I'm sharing it with you today. So when you look at the picture, your, your gaze might initially be drawn to the female dancer. Her pose is unique, it's elegant, and she looks competent, exhilarated and free. And if you look again and see how her partner enables her to safely lean outwards, neither pushing nor pulling her into position. This stance would not have been possible if they were not connected. They're dancing on a sandy beach with a moving shoreline and potentially changeable weather conditions. This requires a different kind of wisdom than dancing inside a studio. Even using the same steps and movement, the imagery would be different in a studio. Similarly, a change of partners would create a new image too, as each couple attends and responds to self, other, and context differently. So like the Argentine tango, we view person-centered leadership as a unique and constantly evolving relationship between people. So I hope you, um, I hope you can see that and I hope you appreciate that description as well that Cardiff came up with. The enactment of person-centeredness, it's been identified as a key attribute to effective workplace cultures. And we know this from the work of Manley and her colleagues from um, more than 10 years ago, leadership is known to have a large impact on workplace and organizational cultures. So let's hear what the chief executive of HETI considers person-centered leadership to look like. Yes, person-centered leadership is, it's the first thing is understanding the self. Because if we don't understand what our triggers are, we can't then position conversations in a meaningful way where we're not reacting to conversations and we need to be enabling of conversations and acknowledging what people are saying. And sometimes if something struck, 
strikes a chord, either positive or not so positive, we can go down that track and that's important to explore those things, but we can be caught up in that area and not really explore what else needs to be undertaken. So for me, person-centeredness is about bringing the genuine self to the table every day and the qualities that engender person-centeredness, so the listening, the compassion, sharing of information, sharing of experiences, and really valuing the contribution that others make to the healthcare system. And listening, listening to learn, listening to understand, and listening to position. Now, so that when I say position, I don't mean necessarily positioning to respond, but positioning to understand what it is the person is communicating and to clarify that I've understood what it is that they're saying in the context in which they're saying it. And of course, sometimes it is positioning to respond, but not formulating your response whilst the person is sharing their experience because then the listening is not occurring. Mm. Yeah, I think that. Thank you, Annette. <laughs> um, so let's have a think about this. If we consider who we are, the leader being, and what we want to move towards, the leader becoming, the work of Michael West is also helpful. And this is Susie's best friend, so she'll be happy I have Michael West in here. Um, his research has investigated how healthcare workplaces can be transformed so they can thrive and flourish. And the key aspect of how we can become a person-centered leader is through education, through learning and development that's flexible, that's high quality and allows development opportunities that promote continuing growth and development. Um, so we can see that, oh, did that just flick off? Sorry, I must have gone back. Um, so it links into us being autonomous to having a sense of belonging and then the contribution that we bring. I love how those two mesh together, who we are and what we um, want to become as leaders. In the last 20 years, significant attention has been given to the necessity of visible effective leadership with evidence demonstrating the impact leadership makes to patients, to staff, to organisations. And key international um, reports and inquiries have asserted that leadership development is vital in healthcare since organisational culture is informed by the nature of its leadership. And Francis said that very clearly in, um, in 2013. In healthcare environments that are immersed in change and chaos, which you guys are all very familiar with, that also have complex issues, leadership cannot be assumed. It requires education. Education enables us to see perspectives. Sometimes we focus on the near, as you can see here, when actually we might need to focus on the big picture as well. So we need to have varying lens um, so that we are seeing things in their entirety and we're not just focusing on what's important to us. <clears throat> We know that roles and titles don't make a leader, but rather behaviours that reflect leadership qualities, which can be learned and developed, as I've already said, and used to influence others. So we might um, say that leadership comprises a set of learnable behaviours, practices and skills that can be developed through such things as reading literature, attending leadership courses, um, and it's been shown that development is actually best achieved through formal leadership development programs and through supportive organizational cultures. So academic research and theory, they do often speak a different language and they can often be addressing a different set of objectives from those pursued by clinicians. So sometimes this accounts for why leadership theory is not implemented into clinical practice. And yet at local, at national and international levels, there remains a drive to translate leadership theory into healthcare practice um, to ensure well-informed and evidence-based voice is given to inform and influence healthcare policy and practice. So leaders should be active role models, um, expounding a clear vision, including all staff, enabling all staff in the professional development process. As Brene Brown says, we are who we are is how we lead. And, um, and I love the work of Julian Stodd. And this um, picture that's here 
it just really resonated with, with me when I completed his quiet leadership course a couple of years ago. So I just give you a moment to reflect on this. What shadow do you cast as a leader? Okay, let's come back to who we are as a leader, as a person-centered leader. And we're just going to take 60 seconds now to pause and consider this. Maybe noting things that pop into your mind, reflections, thoughts, actions, and just use this, um, uh, I don't know what you call this, use this on the slide to um, help guide you, you know, in terms of your reflection and who you are as a leader. So let's just do this in stillness and quietness for a, for a little bit. I hope that that's just given you a few triggers for you to consider, you know, who, who you are as a leader, as a person-centered leader. And now let's just finish with these few questions. You might want to have a think about them. You might want to make some notes yourself. You might want to share something in the chat um, with others if you think that it'd be helpful for them. But just think about how can you be a person-centered leader if that is something that you would like to be. Or how can you strengthen yourself as a person-centered leader if you see yourself as that already? What will it look like, sound like, feel like? And that goes back to right at the beginning when I asked you to consider what you thought it looked like, felt like, and sounded like. And then importantly, how are you going to build your capacity? So is there something that you will commit to think about doing to move forward? Okay. a few references and then the evaluation side so um Susie just asked if we could have this QR code up here so Susie are you happy for me to leave that there and um, I'm really yes thanks Brooke yep thank you. really open to questions or comments if anyone has any um yeah I'd really value your feedback I've unmuted everybody and well you can unmute yourselves now anybody <clears throat> feel free to talk to so Beck really enjoyed your presentation what is the interface of person-centered leadership versus management there's a question there you mute Beck <laughs> Sorry, I had to stop sharing so that I can find the, the unmute button. Um, please let me know if you need that QR code or maybe Susie. You can yeah, I can put that back, back up. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. And thank you, Susan, for that question. I'm thinking that is Susan Dyer that asked me that question. Um, so I think the you know, when we think about management, it's more task oriented. So we can be a terrific leader and manager. We can also be a terrific leader with not as skilled um, uh, management um, qualities. And we can be a terrific manager without um, demonstrating leadership or person-centered leadership. So I think that there, you know, we 
when we think about people that are absolute role models for us, I think they may um, uh, embody both of those things. But I guess from my perspective and from lots of the reading that I've done and from some of the research, I truly believe that the interface is that actually leadership occurs at all levels and it's not associated with position. So, you know, um, I think from a student nurse or a student, anybody in health, right through to somebody who's, you know, experienced and been in multiple roles, we can all have evidence of leadership where we're at. And that doesn't have to be associated with management, with, um, with doing tasks and, um, and undertaking the roles that often are associated with a position of management. I'm not sure if that um, helped or if, if anyone else wants to add to that, you're so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Beck. There's a few questions about um, recording. Just to confirm, it has been recorded and it will get uploaded onto um, South East and Sydney LHD YouTube channel because um, we appreciate people can get disturbed and have to leave a bit early. Nice comments for you there, Beck. Yes, thank you so much for those. I really appreciate that. Well, we've got um, a hand up. Yes, um, I'm sorry, I you're a number on the screen. So you're not a number to me, but you're a number on the screen. So feel free 2206 to 1542, <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Middleton. Um, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor Wilson. <laughs> I suppose I have a little bit more of a comment rather than a question. Um, I just, um, I think obviously it's really fantastic and person-centered leadership's what we all want to experience. But I just want to kind of also say that it's not easy to do all of the time. And um, there are situations where we're challenged and perhaps we don't act and behave in the way that we might wish to act and behave. So I think forgiveness is a very big thing here and people need to be able to forgive themselves for not getting it right 100% of the time and just doing their best. So that's really all I wanted to say. Yeah, no, yeah. thank you so much, Val, because that is so true. Um, you know, we talk about this and it is something that we want to embody, but of course we're human. And um, and so we yeah. look for those opportunities where we can be person-centered in moments, in moments of interactions, in moments of care, in moments of team meetings or whatever it might be. Thank you, Val. That was really, yeah. Yeah, was, so uh, true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, um, Rochelle. That's a it's a great question to Thanks. ask. Um, there is a lot of traditional hierarchy in hospitals and, and in healthcare organisations, and it can definitely be difficult for um, for healthcare professionals to demonstrate person centred leadership and for it to be accepted and embraced by those at, at high levels. That is so true um, because sometimes it's seen as a bit fluffy or a bit, um, uh, you know, it's it's something. It, no one says it's not good, mm. but it can be seen as, um, I guess, a, a nice addition to what we actually yeah. do. So I, I think that when, if we go right back to the beginning of the presentation where I talked about, you know, person-centeredness about being in relation. And then if you think about Sean Cardiff's work as well and how we treat each interaction for what it is. So we, there's no formula, there's no you know, um, one size fits all, but we see the person as a person. And so if we're kind, if we offer forgiveness and all of those sorts of things, that's what will slowly um, start to build a culture that is flourishing. And that, um, because people will see behaviors in, in us or in others that they want, that they think actually that's fantastic. I, I want to see a little bit more of that. And so then we start to grow it within team. Mm. Mm. Helen, did you just raise your hand, your physical hand though? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. There's some mention there too, emotional intelligence back, yeah. 
Yes, Ruth, definitely. Yep. Yep. Um. Great. Thank you. Uh, I know that Helen is trying to unmute, so she might be writing a question at the moment. <laughs> there, can I do it? Mm. Uh, yeah, thank you. I couldn't do it. <laughs> okay, go for it, Helen, and then uh, I'll I was go. just wondering how, as a group of people that want to be person-centred leaders, we can support each other to get the groundswell happening and make it uh, uh, you know more as the way it's done rather than just pockets of person-centered leadership yeah thank you mm. um and i absolutely agree with that it's um finding people that are like-minded that you know have this have similar values so that we can become a collective um mm. with more impact yeah excellent point thank you um and kate uh, giving each other grace, but especially for the leaders to give themselves grace. Yes, that's so true. We're yeah. not going to be perfect all the time. So giving ourselves grace. Yeah. Thank you, Kate, for, for saying that. Um, okay. I'm very mindful of the time, Susie. I'm happy for you to yep. take over and mute me now. <laughs> okay. There's just Chris um, saying there, wondering about the role of emotion in leadership. Too much, you know, equals the chaos, too little mutes agency advocacy responsibilities yes chris that's a really important point to raise as well mm -hmm. so how to, um, practicing how we find that right balance yeah yeah mm -hmm. well we are on time so um you very did so well there keeping to time back and um as your comments have said it's just it was a wonderful presentation and i think um you know me even with my portfolio of leadership it was just uh, it, we need this it's a reflective space you know it's some stuff that we know but having that pause for 45 minutes and listen to you and um share that together of a group was just look wonderful we will send the link someone's asking for the link again it's too big to send so it will go up on um youtube and i'll share it with isla definitely yeah once i've got to go in and cut off all the yeah waffling <laughs> thought provoking and affirming thanks so much that's ruth yeah thanks back then so we'll we'll sign off everybody thanks so much for your time everyone. enjoy yeah your afternoon and evening see thanks so much back thank you thank bye. you everyone bye